All right. Good morning, everybody. And my name is Mary Leonard. I'm chair of the Department of Pediatrics and welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Um, and always we're going to start with our land acknowledgement uh, that we sit on the ancestral land of the Muwakama Ohlone tribe. Um, and then also on the left slide here, as always, we have a little bit of housekeeping regarding Grand Rounds, CME and MOC credit. So today is a very, very special Grand Rounds. This is a special annual event, and I'll say a few minute, a few words about that in a minute. Um, but also want to uh, bring your attention to the up to coming pediatric Grand Rounds. A few years ago, we initiated a resident housewide debate. These have been incredibly well attended and very lively events. And this topic next week is this house believes that interviews for pediatric residency should remain in the virtual format. And there's some really interesting conversations around equity. Um, and I think this is going to be a really, really important event. And then the following week, I was very excited to see the title, A Plumber's Perspective on Leaky Pipes. Enhancing Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. This Grand Round speaker was invited by our Division of Cardiology. Some of you may be thinking, oh, that's when we're all at the Pediatric Academic Societies. But we hope people will zoom in. I know I will. Um, and then, of course, it will be recorded. And I think this will be a really important Grand Rounds for all of us to see. And it will generate a lot of great discussion. Um, and then also want to make sure everybody knows that the pediatric research retreat is right around the corner, April 20th. Um, we have a wonderful keynote speaker, one of our colleagues in immunology on the adult side. Um, and then this is a great day to come together to celebrate. And we have wonderful representation on the program committee and then also on the agenda. Our learners, as an example, our, our fellows and postdocs all the way through some of our most senior and distinguished faculty, and then really looking forward to the roundtable discussion. Um, what can your department do for you? Um, and so I hope people will find that really helpful too. All right, so this is the Harvey J. Cohen MD, PhD Endowed Lectureship in Pediatrics. I think most people know, but for our Packard 101 folks that are joining us today, Harvey was the chair of the Department of Pediatrics and the chief of staff really when the new, when this hospital opened, um, such an important part of our history. And when he stepped down and from those roles back um, shortly after he stepped down in 2008, the hospital endowed this lectureship. We have used it ever since as a way of showcasing some of our most exciting um, physician scientists. And we were thinking at the lovely dinner we had with Harvey and his wife last night, along with Barraquette and his mentors, Tim Cornell, uh, Dan Bernstein, Christina Vera, that in future years, we will show a slide of all of our faculty that have spoke at this lecture because it's an incredible lineup, all of whom are still here and really continue to, to do wonderful work. So with that, let me just say a few words about today's speaker, Eric Head. Eric was recruited here right around the time I became department chair from John Hopkins, where he started his basic science research program on myocardial oxidative stress and less ventricular dysfunction in a model of sepsis. Here in the Department of Pediatric, we have something called the Bridge to K program to help our fellows transition to uh, NIH-funded K Career Development Awards. Bearcat was in the very first class, and all four, I would, might note, of the people in that class of instructors through Bridge to K are now on our faculty. He then uh, was the recipient of a very prestigious and competitive national K-12 grant um, run out of Utah um, on pediatric trauma and critical care scientist development program. And the title of that grant was the role of mitochondrial oxidative stress and mitochondrial dynamics in sepsis induced myocardial dysfunction. And then even more impressive, impressive transition from that institutional K to an individual K, something called the K99ROO um, NIH career development award um, on dysregulation of mitochondrial dynamics and sepsis induced multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. Beckett has done a wonderful job of taking advantage of other funding opportunities across campus, both through the Maternal and Child Health Research Institute, but also through SPARC, which is our translational research program and received a grant from them on identifying a small molecule inhibitor of immune dysregulation in pediatric sepsis. So maybe we'll hear about how some of this fundamental discovery now is moving into options for therapy. Really impressive scholarship um, with uh, more than 40 publications. And then just in the last couple of years, some really important senior author publications on this work. Um, but I also wanna call out the important role he's playing in education for both the Division of Critical Care Medicine as well as the department more broadly. He's the Associate Program Director for our Critical Care Medicine Fellowship and really helping bring robust research mentorship to the division. 
He's the recipient of the Golden Apple Teaching Award, and he's published some really um, nice publications on point of care ultrasound education curriculum and how ultrasound education improves safety for peripheral IV catheter insertion in critically ill children. I've already mentioned some of his mentors, Dan Bernstein, Daria Mokley Rosley, uh, Christina, and others. Um, and we're just delighted to celebrate you and to celebrate Harvey. So welcome, Bearcat. Well, th thank you so much for this uh, wonderful opportunity to present the Cone Lecture. It is truly an honor. Um, uh, looking back at who has uh, taken this podium to uh, uh, talk for this event. And so uh, I'm also super excited to uh, share my passion around uh, mitochondrial biology and uh, in particular uh, the role of mitochondrial dynamics and sepsis-induced end organ failure and other inflammatory disorders. A couple of disclosures uh, that I have to make. Um, we do have NIH as well as foundation support for some of this work. We have a provisional patent on uh, some small molecules that I will highlight and I have uh, previously consulted for Vivrion on topics that are unrelated to the talk today. <clears throat> and over the next uh, 45 or so minutes, uh, my goals are to define mitochondrial dynamics, uh, uh, discuss its role in physiologic and pathologic conditions with a particular focus on mitochondrial fission and sepsis and other inflammatory disorders, uh, discuss how alterations in mitochondrial dynamics could uh, um, influence extracellular mitochondrial content and its implications on innate immune function, and then close off by discussing the current state of uh, pharmacological tools that are there to augment mitochondrial dynamics, in particular, uh, uh, excessive or aberrant mitochondrial fragmentation, and potentially introduce uh, some tools that could uh, limit uh, uh, basically uh, bridge the translational gaps that are there for current state. Um, and before we get into that, I, I want to just highlight, I'm an intensivist, and um, I, I want to impress upon you why an intensivist should care about uh, the mitochondria. And I personally think that um, this organelle has a collinear role to what we do in intensive care medicine, perhaps also all of uh, pediatrics, which is um, to meet end organ metabolic demand. Um, and we do this currently with tools that deal with oxygen delivery. So uh, it wouldn't be an ICU related talk if the oxygen uh, delivery equations are not on the screen uh, early on. Um, so we, uh, we give oxygen, we give an, uh, positive pressure ventilation, all to increase um, oxygen carrying capacity. We transfuse patients to increase oxygen carrying capacity. We uh, deal with uh, drugs that increase cardiac output by uh, addressing lucitropy, chronotropy, dronotropy, inotropy. All of those things all deal with oxygen delivery. However, we do not have a single therapy that deals with efficiency of oxygen extraction at the end organ or the efficiency of uh, uh, cellular respiration, which is big components of our mode of operandi, which is to meet end organ metabolic demand. And a perfect example of a disease where our therapeutic limitations uh, lead to multi-organ system failure is a severe sepsis and septic shock. Now, it's estimated that one out of 10 pediatric ICU beds are filled with a patient that's suffering from sepsis. And this costs us egregious amounts of money, um, uh, over $7 billion in hospitalizations alone annually in the United States. And despite all of those uh, investments, it is still one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in the ICU. And this is highlighted in the Sprout study, which was an observational study that looked at over 128 centers in 26 different countries to look at the current state of uh, sepsis epidemi epidemiology. Uh, and uh, what they have highlighted uh, here is that despite all of the early intervention um, uh, uh, manage, uh, strategies that we put in place, including uh, early recognition of signs and symptoms of sepsis, goal-directed therapy, early source control, still sepsis-induced in mortality sits anywhere between 20 to 25 percent in our ICUs across all ages. And when we look further into why children die from sepsis, um, we still have this bimodal distribution um, where we see a first peak around um, uh, early uh, mortality, which is uh, linked with inadequate resuscitation and cardiovascular co collapse. And that has uh, fortunately decreased substantially. But what is still persistent for, and perhaps more prevalent is the late mortality, which is associated with multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, uh, as well as uh, immune dysfunction. And when you think about 
sepsis-induced multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, one uh, theme is highlighted across all end organs that have been looked at uh, that have uh, organ dys dysfunction, which is the uh, theme of uh, psychopathic hypoxia or the inability to produce ATP in settings where you have normal or supranormal levels of oxygen. And this has shifted um, the uh, field of sepsis research a little bit over the last 20 years around mitochondrial biology, and there have been extensive discoveries that have highlighted that um, there are multiple mechanisms that are involved in mitochondrial dysfunction and sepsis, and this includes things like impairments in the electron transport chain, which is necessary for uh, ATP production, uh, impairments in ROS uh, handling, so leading to superoxide or hydrogen peroxide production that ends up uh, do inducing uh, oxidative damage of lipids, proteins, uh, DNA. Uh, shifts in calcium handling at the level of the mitochondria, which swells the mitochondria and leads to rupture, uh, and eventually leak of uh, apoptotic proteins, cell delta proteins from the mitochondria that uh, end up uh, inducing uh, caspase-dependent cell death pathways. And unfortunately, all of these uh, mechanisms are somewhat interdependent and lead to a feed-forward cycle. And so uh, designing therapeutics that prevent mitochondrial damage and sepsis has been quite a challenge. And what is less uh, well described is uh, how the mitochondria deals with um, uh, damage uh, um, uh, to basically preserve cellular function. And this is mediated through uh, changes in mitochondrial morphology. Now, I wanted to highlight this uh, uh, time-lapse photomicrograph of uh, GFP and M cherry tagged mito uh, mitochondria, which was published in Stephen Archer's review to highlight the fact that in comparison to what is ta taught in our uh, biology textbook, mitochondria are extremely networked organelles. They're highly dynamic. These are mitochondria that are shifting in morphology, and they are highly responsive to uh, cellular demands and their microenvironment. And these shifts in mitochondrial morphology shift metabolism, thus shifting cellular function. So this is a very important function of the mitochondria. And <clears throat> how do they uh, mediate this mitochondrial dynamics or mitochondrial shift? And this is mediated through a series of uh, uh, cellular processes, which um, uh, include mitochondrial fusion, which is the merger of mitochondria to form networks that are efficient at cellular respiration and ATP production. And this is mediated by uh, uh, two key proteins that are mitophysins 1 and 2, as well as optic atrophy 1. And then the counterfactual is mitochondrial fission or mitochondrial fragmentation. And this is a very important process that we've spent a lot of time thinking about, which is the ability of the mitochondria to segregate parts of its network when they're damaged to allow it to be recycled through mitochondrial autophagy or mitophagy. And this is mediated through a key protein, which has been the focus of our research, which is um, dynamin-related protein 1, or DRP1. Now, dynamin-related protein 1 is the GTPase protein uh, that belongs to the dynamin superfamily of protein. It's found in nearly all cells. Um, there are seven isoforms of it. It is normally found in the cytosol. Um, and when it's activated through a series of phosphorylation events, it localizes to the mitochondria, where it interacts with a couple of adapters, BIS1, MID49, MID51, as well as MFF. And this allows it to oligomerize uh, at the level of the mitochondria and quench the outer mitochondrial membrane, allowing it to separate or to mediate the fission process. And as you can imagine, this is an important cellular process for cell division, for example, mitochondrial quality control, for example. However, if it's left unchecked, it could lead to excessive mitochondrial fragmentation. And uh, this leads to mitochondria that are inefficient at cellular respiration, that are inefficient at ATP production, and produce uh, excessive amounts of ROS. And one a uh, particular interaction between DRP1 and its mitochondrial adapter FIS1 has been really implicated in uh, pathologic or aberrant mitochondrial fragmentation, and it's been studied in neurodegenerative disorders as well as ischemia reperfusion. And I've been interested in its role in a sepsis and sepsis-induced mods. And so over the last uh, six plus years, um, we have shown using preclinical models of sepsis, here I'm highlighting uh, endotoxemia model, uh, that DRP1 activation happens quite early uh, following uh, an inflammatory stimulus. So, and this happens in metabolically active end organs. So here we're looking at uh, 
cardiac tissue from mice that are treated with LPS or control. And um, uh, you could see that there's an increase in DRP1 phosphorylation uh, that is seen, which is a key post-translational modification that needs to happen for it to be activated and an increase in mitochondrial localization of DRP1 uh, following LPS stimulation. This is also associated with shifts in the morphology of the mitochondria. Um, uh, here you're seeing uh, electron micrographs from cardiac tissue of mice that were treated with vehicle versus uh, LPS. And as you can see, the mitochondria are typically networked, um, filamentous, and dense. In comparison to following LPS, they are disorganized, there is loss of inner and outer mitochondrial membrane uh, integrity, and their cristae density is decreased, all suggesting that there is LPS-mediated mitochondrial damage. And to get a more in-depth assessment of this, we switched to an uh, in vitro or a cell line model of um, uh, septic cardiomyopathy. Uh, here we use H9C2 cardiomyoblasts to treat them with uh, LPS and look at shifts in mitochondrial morphology and how it relates to cellular respiration. And similar to what we see in our electron micrographs, uh, this is mitre tracker deep red stained uh, uh, H9C2 cardiomyocytes following LPS treatment. You could see that there's a shift in their uh, morphology to these more punctate fragmented mitochondria in comparison to the networked mitochondria. And this has implications in cellular respiration. This is an assay that we commonly use. It's called seahorse oxography, um, where we look at oxygen consumption rate as an indirect surrogate to um, uh, cellular respiration. And what it shows is that there is a temporal uh, progression of how much oxygen consumption there is, especially in spare respiratory capacity and a maximum oxygen consumption rate following LPS treatment that temporally correlates with the shift in mitochondrial morphology. Similarly, we see a progressive increase in oxidative stress and ultimately a decrease in ATP production. All to say that uh, uh, in our preclinical models, we see that there is uh, mitochondrial fragmentation following, following LPS treatment that is collinear with impairments in mitochondrial function. Now, the question is whether it truly is related to DRP1 hyperactivation or it's through an unrelated mechanism. And so to answer this question, we uh, used our H9C2 cardiomyoblasts, uh, transfected them with uh, wild type or DRP1 phosphomimetic mutants. And these uh, uh, mutant plasmid uh, induce uh, DRP1 activation independent of LPS. Um, and so this is a way to answer whether or not this mechanism is truly important. And as you can see here, um, uh, the phosphomimetic mutants induce uh, uh, impairments in mitochondrial membrane potential, as well as an increase in mitochondrial ROS, suggesting that DRP1 uh, hyperactivation is indeed a mechanism that could induce uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. And ultimately, the next question is if we can, you know, hyperactivate it, can we also block it? And does that lead to a protective phenotype? And so to do this, we uh, used rationally designed peptides. These were, uh, uh, in particular, peptide P110, which was um, identified and uh, validated in the Moshley Rosen uh, library. Um, and it particularly interferes with that DRP1 Phys1 interaction uh, based on a sequence homology between DRP1 and Phys1. And we validated this in our model to make sure that it actually works in our LPS model. As you can see here, these are uh, um, immunofluorescent uh, stained H9C2 cardiomyoblasts, and green is Phys1, and purple is uh, DRP1. And as you can see, following LPS treatment, there is an increase in the amount of DRP1, that's a, the level of the mitochondria, which is decreased following uh, peptide P110. And then we went on to make sure that this is specific to the DRP1 Phys1 interaction using proximal ligation assay, which is uh, uh, based on antibodies for DRP1 and Phys1. And as you can see, when you have a close interaction between DRP1 and Phys1 on this assay, you have increased uh, fluorescent puncta that is substantially decreased with P110. So we know that um, it uh, particularly affects the DRP1 Phys1 interaction and it decreases DRP1 mitochondrial localization. So the next question is, how does it affect uh, cellular respiration? And so we did this with a seahorse oxography in our H9C2 models, and we're able to see that we're, uh, we can improve basal, uh, maximal ATP dependent, as well as uh, spare respiratory capacity, all of which are metrics to look at oxygen consumption rate or cellular respiration um, following P110 treatment. We also can see a substantial decrease in mitochondrial oxidative stress and ultimately an increase in ATP production, all suggesting that 
uh, this mechanism is important for LPS-mediated mitochondrial damage and potentially is a therapeutic target. Uh, we have gone back to do uh, in vivo experiments where we look at um, uh, changes in mitochondrial morphology, and this is now published, uh, but we are able to preserve the mitochondrial architecture with P110 treatment um, in comparison to LPS alone. And this has um, uh, uh, benefits not only for cardiac function, but also uh, bestows a survival benefit uh, in our preclinical models. So as you can see here, with a decrease in uh, uh, mouse sepsis scores, as well as an increase in survival uh, in comparison to vehicle control and uh, P110 treated mice. So over hopefully in the last uh, 15 or so minutes, uh, I've shown you that um, uh, drp phys one dependent mitochondrial fragmentation uh, contributes to mitochondrial dysfunction and mortality in our preclinical models of sepsis, and that rationally designed peptides that interfere with this interaction uh, abrogate some of the uh, pathology that's seen in our preclinical uh, uh, model. Now, I want to switch to a recent observation that has led to um, a new line of investigation, which is the association between excessive or pathologic mitochondrial fragmentation and extracellular mitochondrial content. And we saw this in our uh, in vivo models of sepsis, where we um, uh, take the same septic mice that are treated with and without peptide P110, collect plasma, and then do differential centrifugation to look at cell-free mitochondrial byproducts uh, by various methods. And here I'm showing you a facts-based approach to look at cell-free mitochondrial byproducts. Uh, these are uh, dual stain for uh, TMRM, which looks at membrane potential, and mitotracker green, uh, which is another fluorescent dye for that, that um, is used to label mitochondria. And as previously published, there is a substantial increase in cell-free mitochondrial byproducts after LPS treatment in these mice. And what was interesting is that when uh, we abrogate or when we block the rp one phys one dependent mitochondrial fragmentation, we could see a substantial reduction in cell-free mitochondrial content. And Previously, it's been thought that, you know, the release of mitochondrial byproducts that are in circulation is solely due to cell death, and that's, that's just been the general thought process around it. But more recently, there have been uh, publications that have highlighted that uh, extracellular release of mitochondrial content could be an alternate me mechanism for mitochondrial quality control, especially when mm -hmm. the normal mechanisms that we use to deal with mitochondrial damage are impaired. So a cell wants to survive, perhaps if it can't go through um, uh, mitophagy uh, or if there is an impairment between fission and fission, the best idea is to release this dysfunctional mitochondria. And we know that extracellular mitochondrial byproducts, because the mitochondria ancestrally is um, uh, related to uh, bacteria, it's uh, got archaeobacterial origins, so the, the byproducts that are there on the mitochondria are highly immunogenic. Um, these include things like cell-free ATP, which activates proteogenic receptors and um, uh, a, a whole host of cells, succinate, cardiolipin, which activate inflammasome cascade, and formulated peptides, which are very similar to what's seen on bacterial, uh, um, uh, bacterial peptides. And these activate and formulated peptide receptors on neutrophils and monocytes and macrophages. And then the unmethylated CPG of uh, mitochondrial DNA looks uh, very uh, much similar to bacterial D uh, DNA, and thus is recognized by TLR9 signaling. And this has uh, been studied as a pro-inflammatory um, uh, um, nidus for a variety of diseases, including sepsis, trauma, um, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, and it's starting to gain more traction in uh, transplant immunology as a potential uh, inciting factor in acute graft-versus-host disease, which is a major complication of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. As seen here, it's, uh, it's one of the leading causes of morbidity mortality for patients that are um, uh, going through hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, uh, estimated to have um, incidence of about uh, uh, anywhere 15, 40% and a mortality of about 15%, uh, only second to relapse mortality. And um, the current understandings around the pathobiology of um, acute graft versus dose disease really uh, highlights the fact that you have to have allogenic T cells that have effector function against the target tissue to induce this. However, um, what is thought to be the initiating factor is 
tissue damage that um, is secondary to uh, conditioning regimens that we have to give the patients to ensure that they have engraftment. And this tissue damage mediates the release of uh, pathogen associated and damage associated molecular uh, patterns that end up activating host antigen pre presenting cells and subsequently uh, creating the microenvironment necessary for donor T cell activation expansion after transplantation. And the question that we wanted to look at was um, whether or not, and this is a, a project that's been going on in collaboration with Ken Weinberg, um, uh, Alice Britannia, as well as Rob Nigren's group. And what we wanted to address is whether or not um, uh, myeloblative conditioning that is used as a pre-transplant uh, therapy leads to alterations in mitochondrial dynamics in the host and host tissue, uh, leading to substantial release of cell-free mitochondrial byproduct, which then can activate host antigen presenting cells and create the necessary substrate for uh, T cell expansion and differentiation following transplant, uh, which is necessary for acute reference host disease. And to, to address this, we first started with our uh, in vivo models, we took uh, biopsy mice, uh, used uh, standard doses of uh, conditioning regimens, for example, to total body radiation, um, uh, and, um, and subsequently, and these are therapeutic or clinically pre uh, um, relevant doses, and uh, looked at um, end organs uh, that are affected by acute graft versus host disease to uh, characterize shifts in mitochondrial morphology. And um, what we saw was, uh, what was most dramatic was in the bowel, actually, and intestinal epithelial cells. Uh, these are some photomicrographs from, uh, or electron micrograph from uh, bowel under control condition. As you can see, the mitochondria are more filamentous. And there's a, a substantial shift to fragmented mitochondria within 24 to 72 hours. And then eventually have pretty significant distraction of these mitochondria with uh, almost complete loss of the cristae, uh, loss of outer mitochondrial membrane, all suggesting that, um, you know, some of the cytotoxic conditioning that we use for stem cell transplantation has uh, implications for mitochondrial function, at least at the gut. We saw that there's BRP1 activation following conditioning, um, as seen here with uh, an increase in mitochondrial localization of DRP1 and oxidative modification of mitochondrial proteins, all suggesting that there's oxidative stress of these uh, um, bowel epithelial cells or uh, intestinal epithelial cells. Uh, we went back in vitro once again to um, look at whether or not this has implications in cellular respiration. Uh, these are uh, CACO2 cells, which are um, colonic epithelial cells. We gave them doses of irradiation that are used in the clinic by uh, anywhere from 500 centigrades to uh, 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 1,000 centigrade. Um, and then uh, looked at cellular respiration. As you can imagine, there is uh, decreases in all of the metrics uh, around uh, oxygen consumption uh, that is seen here with basal maximal as well as ATP-dependent oxygen consumption being substantially decreased. Um, we saw a dose-dependent increase in uh, um, uh, Roth production, as well as an, a decrease in uh, ATP production, all of which suggests that there is indeed uh, mitochondrial damage uh, following uh, TBI conditioning. We then looked at whether or not this a uh, shift in mitochondrial morphology and associated mitochondrial function leads to extracellular release of mitochondrial byproducts. Um, for this, we took the supernatant from the uh, irradiated and controlled cells, um, did differential centrifugation to isolate a mitochondrial enriched fraction, and characterize that um, cell-free mitochondrial content. And as you can see here, there's a substantial increase in the content that is seen following TBI conditioning. And the, these mitochondria are substantially fragmented, as you can see in the nanoscope here, that they range anywhere from 150 to 300 uh, uh, nanometers in size, uh, also confirmed by electron micrographs. And while they contain the essential uh, electron complex uh, proteins that are required for cellular respiration, they are really uh, inefficient at uh, producing ATP. And so this is an assay where we uh, provide uh, the necessary complex one substrates to induce uh, ATP production and the kinetics of uh, ATP production in those uh, that are following conditioning is substantially reduced in comparison to control. 
we uh, have asked the same question in vivo and we said, well, you know, do we see the cell-free mitochondrial content following TBI conditioning? Um, and the same signal is there um, uh, following conditioning at 24, uh, 72, and 120 hours that there is cell-free mitochondrial content that's increased. Um, and these uh, extracellular mitochondria have impaired uh, hyperpolarization and ATP production in response to complex one substrate. One thing I wanted to highlight is that this is all independent of uh, cell death, at least in our in vitro models. So we don't see a substantial increase in cell death at the times that we are looking at this. Now, <clears throat> we have gone on to ask whether or not this is clinically pertinent. So uh, in collaboration with the uh, uh, Britannia lab, uh, we have started to collect samples from uh, patients that are undergoing hematopoietic stem cell transplantation uh, to characterize cell-free mitochondrial byproducts following conditioning. Um, we've collected about uh, 50 patients where we uh, look at samples prior to their conditioning at day zero, which is a day of transplant following their conditioning, and then uh, one and two weeks after. And especially when you look at the subset of patients that got uh, TBI as a, a, a component of their conditioning regimen, there is this increase in cell-free mitochondrial content uh, that is there suggesting that our preclinical observations are clinically pertinent. And ultimately, the question you want to address is whether or not, um, sorry, um, whether or not um, this uh, has implications in, uh, in GVHD severity and mortality. And so we do this uh, using uh, a major mismatch model of um, acute GVHD. Um, this is a model in which we take bulb sea mice, we irradiate them, um, and then subsequently transplant them with hematopoietic stem cells and splenocytes from black six mice. So it's a major mismatch. It has a pretty aggressive acute reference host disease uh, 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 phenotype. And in a subset of them, we also give them uh, isolated syngeneic uh, mitochondria at uh, escalating doses. And classically, the model should look like this, where you are able to, if you uh, give them TBI conditioning and do not um, transplant them, they uh, die within the first two weeks. Uh, and you could substantially improve um, uh, uh, survival if you give them hematopoietic stem cells from bone marrow, as seen here in green. And when you introduce allogenic T cells um, uh, from splenocytes, you start to see GVHD-related mortality, which is seen here. And what we saw was that when you introduce mitochondria into that model, where you have increased um, uh, cell-free mitochondrial byproducts at uh, different doses, we're able to see an increase in GVHD-associated mortality, seen here by um, a decrease in um, uh, their survival rate um, on the KM curves and also a worsening of GVHD scores that are seen here. We know this is um, specific to GVHD because if you give the mice that only got hematopoietic stem cells from bone marrow uh, isolated syngeneic mitochondria, you really don't see uh, mortality that's associated to, uh, to it. So it has to be uh, related to that allogenic T cells that you're getting. Um, we have also validated this by looking at um, uh, MLR experiments uh, to show that indeed T cell expansion and uh, activation occurs. Um, we are now looking at uh, whether or not um, inhibiting excessive mitochondrial fragmentations through some of the compounds that I have discussed before has a uh, therapeutic potential in preventing uh, uh, myeloblative conditioning mediated tissue damage. Uh, so far, we've shown that it, you know, you're able to interfere with the a hyperfragmentation phenotype in the intestinal epithelial cells if you give them peptide P110, uh, as shown here by improvements in their aspect ratio as well as form factor. Um, we have also shown that we could decrease the uh, cell-free mitochondrial content that is released uh, following TBI conditioning at the time points that I've highlighted here, 24, 72, and 120 hours following uh, TBI conditioning. Um, and we're doing the necessary next experiments, which is whether or not it has a therapeutic potential in uh, GVHD severity and mortality. Now, I've highlighted uh, uh, several places where um, com uh, peptides that interfere with uh, brp one phys one interaction could be uh, beneficial. Uh, however, it has some therapeutic limitations. It's a hot conjugated peptide, um, so it requires a cell-penetrating peptide for uh, intracellular de delivery. It's not orally bioavailable, and it's very sensitive to proteolytic cleavage. Uh, um, and so it has a limited uh, stability in plasma. And so all of the experiments, we have to use um, oslet pumps to get a continuous infusion going on these uh, um, 
uh, these mice, and it is bulky, and so it has limited blood-brain barrier and penetration. So all of those things limit its ability to um, translate to the clinic. And um, one of the solutions that we're working through is, uh, and this is a collaboration that's uh, going on between our group and the Mushley Rosen Laboratory, um, which is to identify small molecule memetics of peptide P110. Now, I have highlighted that it's really um, interferes with the DRP1 Phys1 interaction, but also one other aspect that we have uh, discovered is that it is actually an allosteric inhibitor of DRP1's GTKs activity. Um, and this is seen in these uh, KM curves where we take recombinant uh, DRP1 co-incubated with cyclic P110 and look at GTP hydrolysis with incre increasing nucleotide concentrations. And as you can see, uh, co-incubating um, uh, cyclic P110 decreases both CAM and Bmax, suggesting allosteric or non-competitive inhibition. And when you look at the crystal structure for DRP1 and focus on the site where um, uh, the sequence homology was used to identify peptide P110, it comes from this uh, unstructured loop on the switch one um, uh, region of the um, uh, GTPase domain of DRP1. And this unstructured loop, when it binds to a nucleotide, um, shifts in its conformation and it opens up uh, this pocket, which is highlighted here in uh, cyan, which is a very druggable pocket. And we have confirmed that this is an important pocket for uh, perhaps DRP1, P110 interaction, DRP1 Phys1 interaction, using alanine scanning to mutate this pocket and show that you can lose that interaction. And it, it is one of the few sites on uh, DRP1 that uh, seems to be uh, druggable on uh, essential site uh, scanning analysis. And so using this a priori knowledge, uh, what we have started to do is um, uh, do an in silico screen of the commercial compound collection library um, uh, to identify small molecule memetic that might interact with that switch one adjacent groove. And so far we have identified um, several hits out of which three seem to have a similar allosteric inhibition of DRP1's GTPase activity. Here I'm highlighting SC1, SC3, and SC9. And SC9 in particular um, seems to have um, uh, preclinical efficacy. And so um, we're uh, here, I'm highlighting the H9C2 cardiomyoblast uh, uh, model where we treat it with LPS. And similar to what we see with peptide P110, uh, compound SC9 seems to decrease uh, DRP1 mitochondrial localization and DRP1 Phys1 interaction. We've also shown that it could preserve mitochondrial architecture, um, um, uh, similar to peptide P110, um, as seen here following LPS treatment. And this has implications for improvement and uh, mitochondrial membrane potential as well. And so far we have done uh, the in vivo experiments for uh, compound SC9 and shown that we could have a similar uh, survival benefit um, uh, following LPS treatment, uh, suggesting that this might be a hit compound that we move forward. And currently we're working through PKPD experiments to uh, look at the stability of the compound uh, and uh, also doing uh, structure activity assays to look at analogs that might uh, be lead compounds for this. So I hope in the last uh, 45 minutes or so, um, I have a uh, highlighted the fact that uh, DRP1 uh, Phys1 dependent mitochondrial fragmentation is uh, a significant contributor to mitochondrial dysfunction in sepsis and uh, perhaps other uh, um, inflammatory disorders. Um, uh, this pep uh, and rationally designed peptides that interfere with this interaction seem to have uh, preclinical benefits. Um, however, there is some translational limitations and uh, our hope is that um, some of the small molecule memetics that we have identified are able to bridge some of these translational gaps uh, that we're seeing with um, uh, therapies for uh, abrogating pathologic mitochondrial fragmentation. And with that, I, I really want to thank um, uh, my colleagues, collaborators that have been instrumental for uh, this work. Um, I want to highlight Vijit Vijayan, who is a uh, a uh, visiting instructor in our lab who has done a lot of the GVHD work along with um, uh, Colton, uh, uh, as well as Kaylin and Ao and Julian, as well as Julian Rashna and uh, uh, Ken's, Rob's, as well as uh, uh, Aliche's lab. Um, and then uh, uh, Shinjin Lee, who's been uh, very much uh, in the weeds with uh, Louis and Suman um, uh, from the Diary of Mos Moshley Rosen Laboratory. Um, uh, with the small molecule project. And 
um, none of this would be possible without their support and help. And so I'm grateful for that and um, uh, grateful for some of the funding uh, for these projects and happy to take any questions you might have. All right, that was incredibly elegant and so exciting how quickly you're moving into therapeutic opportunities. And I had no idea you were looking at TBI and stem cell transplantation. So I have lots of questions there, but others have questions. If you could identify yourself for our friends on Zoom before you ask your question, right. thank uh, you. Dan Bernstein, uh, Barakat, that was absolutely awesome. Um, the work that you've done, of which I've been following over these years, has just really moved into some really critically important areas. And I'm just so excited for you. Um, so mitochondria, mitochondrial fission is part of a process that uh, essentially it's a housekeeping process that allows bad mitochondria, damaged mitochondria to be eliminated by the cell through processes like metophagy or, you know, or, or being jettisoned from, from the cell. Um, if you interfere with it, it sounds like you have some data that suggests that that's good. On the other hand, do you then wind up with less competent mitochondria in the cell? Um, and are there potentially longer term uh, detrimental effects of blocking this housekeeping function? Yeah, I, I think it's a very good question. Um, so. Uh, Often it goes in hand in hand with um, uh, four processes, as you mentioned. You know, uh, uh, fission is um, uh, goes hand in hand with mitophagy, but also biogenesis. On the other hand, is the key process of generating new mitochondria that occurs. Um, we haven't extensively looked at how it has implications for biogenesis, for example, um, and so um, whether or not it, over long periods of time. This uh, is replaced by uh, you know, uh, uh, novel uh, mitochondria, something that we don't know. Um, and uh, at least in the neurodegenerative models that uh, uh, Daria's group has looked at, long-term uh, treatment with peptide P110 didn't have substantial detriments in um, uh, uh, um, end organ function. Uh, and we've also started to do some of those uh, long-term experiments for SC9. So, at least uh, we're not seeing toxicities thus far, um, uh, but more, this is a question that needs further investigation. Hi, Harvey Cohen. Fantastic, Birkett. I mean, if this is an incredible tour de force that you've done. What's that? Uh, and thank you for speaking about my favorite organelle, the mitochondria. <laughs> Um, it goes back to my days as a biochemist. I have two questions for you. One clinical related to the stem cell transplant work. And as I noticed, there's actually a marked difference in the amount of fragmentation of the mitochondria that you find in various patients. And we've always been trying to find predictors of graft versus host disease because you know you treat the patients pretty much the same way and yet some get very bad graft versus host disease. And the question is, can you look at those data to see if those individuals that had higher levels of the fragmentation actually had a greater incidence of graft versus host disease. Yeah, I, you know, it, that, that data is going to be its own project fully. Um, and we, we do have some early data that suggests that uh, spike at the early time point. And so, so these are small sam sample sizes. So a spike in the day zero um, uh, uh, cell-free mitochondrial content is um, uh, linked with uh, GBHD. At least we see a higher amount of it in uh, patients that have acute GBHD than those that do not. Uh, but I think there's um, a multitude of other uh, questions that uh, go along with that, which is basically how much content are they coming into the transplant with? And so mm -hmm. I think, I think there, and, and how does the uh, previous disease process that they were, uh, uh, you know, suffering from and have implications to um, the uh, self-free mitochondrial content. So as you noticed, I, uh, all of the uh, data for the patients, we have normalized to their pre-TBI uh, conditioning because there's vast variability in the amount of self-free mitochondrial content that's seen prior to them coming in. So um, I think there is going to be um, multiple uh, uh, questions that we need to address with, with, with that data. And the second question has to do more uh, biochemistry, and that is you have two phenomena occurring uh, with this fragmentation 
One is decreased ATP production and the other is increased uh, ROS. And the question is, are they both endpoint phenomena or does one cause the other? And is there any way of seeing whether if you blocked the effect on the ROS, would you prevent the effect on ATP? Yeah, so it's a double-edged sword. As you know, um, ROS production is a natural byproduct of the TCA cycle. If you uh, produce more ATP, you're going to produce more superoxide, but you have ROS handling mechanisms that are there. Um, now, uh, the, uh, uh, we have looked at ROS scavengers, treating with the ROS scavengers, and uh, they have uh, shown some preclinical efficacy, but have fallen short to uh, going any further in several models. My MitoQ is one, MitoTempo is another one, SS31 is another one, um, all of them uh, having limitations. I suspect that um, the ROS handling is not the only um, uh, component that needs to be addressed in these dysfunctional mitochondria. Um, uh, and I suspect uh, there's uh, other, uh, other components that need to be dealt with. Uh, I'm not sure that answered your question. Uh, thank you, Birkett. That was a great talk. Really appreciate it. Uh, David Cornfield, uh, pulmonary. Um, so this relates to Harvey's question. What do you think is upstream of the mitochondrial damage? We, we know that oxygen sensing is mediated through a number of different mechanisms, including at the mitochondrial level. Is there any, and membrane potential is one of the changes that occurs early in mitochondrial damage. Do you have any thoughts about what might be upstream of DRIP-1, what might be upstream of the uh, ensuing fission and or fusion? Yeah, um, we, we know um, uh, several of the uh, molecular processes that uh, lead to DRP-1 activation. So um, uh, DRP-1 activation is uh, uh, mediated through uh, post-translational modifications, in particular phosphorylation that happens by uh, delta PKC signaling. And delta PKC activation happens for a whole host of reasons, including, um, you know, uh, uh, HIFA and alpha has been implicated in it. Uh, changes in diacylglycerol have been implicated in it, and changes in calcium flux have been implicated in it. So um, there is a whole host of um, inflammatory stimulants that uh, promote um, uh, uh, activation of uh, uh, DERP1 uh, 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 that um, lead to the fission process. What um, is still un unsure to us and is uh, why is that particular interaction between DRP1 and FIS1 one that is uh, associated with aberrant or excessive fragmentation in comparison to when you block, for example, DRP1 uh, MFF or DRP1 uh, mid-49, mid-51 uh, interaction, you get these elongated dysfunctional mitochondria. So there is... Um, uh, um, uh, there has to be conformational changes in DRP1 that predispose it, uh, dispose it to interact with one inter uh, 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 mitochondrial adapter uh, in comparison to the other. So um, I think there's two questions of that, uh, which is how do we um, manipulate, um, you know, physiologic versus pathologic fragmentation, as uh, Dan mentioned, which is essential for quality control, and then um, how do we work on upstream mechanisms, which uh, is a little bit harder because they have a ton of off-target effects. Um, and so we have a pan-DRP1 inhibitor, which um, you know uh, affects delta PKC, but you have to deal with all the other uh, you know post-translational events that are necessary with the uh, delta PKC uh, inactivation. Okay, we have really good questions from our online participants, actually from multiple different disciplines. So first is Nicole McKenzie. Which cell-free mitochondria byproducts appear in the circulating plasma volume in the greatest concentration during GBHD? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. So um, uh, in short, we have no clue yet. Um, we have a collaboration with the uh, uh, Biohub uh, mass spec facility. And so we're starting to do the multi-omic uh, analyses that are going to be necessary to answer that. Um, and uh, perhaps, uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, once that is concluded, I could answer the question. But um, right now, it's really hard for me to say. Okay. Sunny Singh from Critical Care Medicine. 
excellent talk, exclamation mark. Your data showed that DRP1 is necessary for mitochondrial fission, but is it sufficient for mitochondrial fission or are there other molecules involved? And do you have a DRP1 knockout mouse? Yeah. Um, so the second question is easier to answer than the first. So we do have a DRP1 knockout mouse. Um, it's a, 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 a cardiac uh, a specific a knockout. Um, and uh, so we're doing some of those exp experiments. Um, Pan-DRP1 inhibition is um, actually detrimental. So uh, having um, a, a global knockout is not, uh, is not visible. And the first question, I apologize. Uh, is it necessary, but is it's necessary, but is it sufficient? Is, is it sufficient? It's necessary for fission. Yeah, so uh, we, mm, that's a fair question. Right now, that is the only molecular mechanism that has been identified uh, to uh, promote or mediate mitochondrial fragmentation. However, um, uh, some of the data around uh, mitochondrial-derived vesicles, which are these little blebs that come off of the mitochondria that happen early after damage, um, it's being debated whether uh, that these are DRP1-dependent or independent. So um, more to come. I, you know, I, uh, right now, I, I think there might be more mechanisms. Good. Okay. Ken Weinberg from Stem Cell Transplant. First, great talk, all caps. <laughs> are there differences in baseline levels of extracellular mitochondria that are health associated, for example, aging, atherosclerosis, or weathering? Yeah, um, that's where it's been um, uh, looked at is um, uh, a lot of the um, aging and um, also um, uh, cardiovascular disease data. And majority of the d data focuses on um, uh, you know, a couple of uh, a molecules. So it, it focuses a lot of the literature focuses on mitochondrial DNA, which is um, what has been uh, fairly well characterized. And uh, there are, um, you know, patient uh, um, variabilities amongst patients, and it has implications uh, long term um, to in short. Good. Okay. And then Alma, also from stem cell transplant, wonderful talk. Um, I'm sorry if this was mentioned at the beginning, but did you check if cell-free mitochondrial component contains oxidized DNA? And then you can look at the abbreviations here. <laughs> oxidized mitochondrial DNA can activate PDC to secrete high amounts of type 1 interferon, yeah. which could worsen inflammation. Inflammation could then be blocked as an easy therapeutic intervention. Yeah. Interferon. So we, uh, we are looking at um, uh, mitochondrial, uh, at least uh, the... Um, artifacts of mitochondrial DNA uh, oxidative damage. So, for example, um, uh, 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 looking at uh, um, uh, DNA methylation of mitochondrial DNA, um, and we're quantifying the abundance of cell-free mitochondrial DNA. Um, uh, so that's an ongoing uh, process in our um, clinical samples. All right, great. And then the question that I had um, is, as we think about cancer survivors and TB, TBI and other effects of TBI, so for instance, total body radiation has been associated with osteoporosis, with sarcopenia. Have you thought about other end organs that might be affected by this beyond GBHD? Yeah. Uh, so we uh, have focused on the, the the way we got to the bowel, as you, you can imagine, is uh, by starting with, you know, what, where do we see a GVHD? But um, we've done this in a multi, a multiple different cell lines that are uh, hematopoietic in origin and also somatic. And you do see some effect and it's variable. And so, um, for example, uh, endothelial cells are substantially affected by this. Um, uh, we see this in also um, hex cells uh, as well, where we have looked at it. Um, so I suspect that there is other uh, end organs that are affected, but that we haven't looked at. Okay, and then the last question is a big line of investigation from Irv Weifsman and others here is antibody-based conditioning as opposed to TBI conditioning. Is there an opportunity to go into those populations and do some comparisons? Yeah, so the signal is the strongest with TBI conditioning, mm -hmm. um, um, and we just don't have the cohort size yet to yeah. answer the question, and to be honest. Good. Okay. Well, that was a wonderful discussion, and I just want to congratulate and thank you. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.